So thank you very much, Joao, um, for inviting SEPI today. We are representing in Brussels the European Coordination of Independent Producers. It's also known as the European uh, Audiovisual Production Association because we merged together the film and TV side of the sector and we represent more or less 19 uh, associations of independent producers across Europe from Nordic countries to the south of Europe, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, at the moment, um, we are involved today. There is the summit uh, in Brussels. You cannot hear because I closed all the windows, but we have helicopters going around because it's about uh, two days of intense talk that takes place between uh, member states and relevant ministers. And uh, for SEPI specifically, as for many other actors in the culture and creative sector, is a very important day because we have, as I told you before, we have uh, worked all together synergetically on um, a big, uh, big action to raise awareness of the importance of culture nowadays uh, for the policymakers that are taking important decisions uh, at the moment uh, in terms of budget availability. They are building up uh, the European budget at the moment. Um, you probably imagine or understand that there is a lot of uh, difficulty in terms of where we allocate because there has been a crisis that affected so many sectors, not only the culture sector. But we have an incredible number of small and medium enterprises and artists and performers in the cultural sector that are really at the core of the uh, European economy, the third, the third, uh, you know, uh, sector that is bringing much more EU GDP, I would say. So it's important that they take this into consideration. So SEPI was very happy to participate with many other European associations in putting together a letter with very good personalities from the cultural sector. We have also somebody from Portugal, uh, Salvatore, uh, I always, Sal Salvatore Sobral, because I always mispronounce his, his, his surname, but it's not fair because I know his song, because I, watch, I watched him when he presented it in the Eurovision Song Context, and we liked, we voted also for him, the Italians, so. Um, so, and that is a name, but there are so many other names. There are 40 great artists, producers, um, composers, writers that appear in this letter. This gives you the level, the weight of, of this action, because we really care about the values that, that, uh, that culture can bring to, to Europe. Um, it's important. Let's not forget that uh, you probably are aware of it because I think it's been similar in Portugal as well. During the lockdown, we all read novels, watched TV series, film uh, at home, and we have been all involved in listening to the music. This is all culture that has entertained us and has made a big effort to, to help uh, citizens to survive this moment of crisis, but there is also the economic side of this, you know, of, of this uh, sector that uh, is in danger, <coughs> is in danger, sorry, if we don't um, uh, really make sure that it is preserved, because we have been in a situation where the, the, the sector has been in a crisis, the crisis is not finished. If you think about many cinemas nowadays, they are all reopening. It's fantastic that in many countries, especially in countries like ours, uh, Joao, like Spain or Italy, you have a lot of uh, outdoor cinemas, so to say, drive-in cinemas. It's, it's a nice concept to think about. Um, but still, the reality is some people are scared. So the number of seats you have in a cinema are less. Uh, that means less money for the cinemas coming in. And, and that is obviously uh, has an impact on the distribution chain as well. 
uh, for cinema and uh, it's all interlinked, this big value chain that is the audiovisual and film value chain is interlinked. And if one of us goes down, everybody will go down. So it's important that the policymakers at national level understand that we need support from an economic point of view, but also from a regulatory point of view. There are a lot of important files and dossiers, maybe we can speak later more in details about them, that will be crucial for all of us and that uh, Europe we ha will have to face in the months to come. But at the moment, we need the member states to understand they have to put culture as a priority. Because if they do not, people, businesses, artists will not have access to the recovery funding, uh, the recovery plan that has been developed by the EU. So it's important that it is recognized at the national level to be used. And if it doesn't happen, you know, it's money that is there. But our artists in Portugal, in Italy, in France, in the Nordic country will not be able simply to use it. So it's important that policymakers understand that. So we hope that today, below these helicopters and these discussions and all the press that has been fantastic in Portugal, in Spain, in France, and many other countries, they are all flagging this important issue. So we hope that uh, the commissioners will listen to us and the member states will listen to us. By the way, there is, um, you know, as I said, there is a, a big change of the budget. Um, there was a proposal for Creative Europe, which is the budget dedicated uh, to Europe. And regrettably, this was even lower than in 2018, which clearly was a bit uh, disappointing for us. Uh, we know that the Commission uh, in the past has really pushed for having a strong budget on Creative Europe, and the European Commission has helped a lot in terms of, you know, making this budget more flexible, considering the, you know, the crisis. A lot of the bureaucratic aspects of it were easy because uh, they were facilitated because it's otherwise it, it would have been a quite difficult. Um, but of course, now uh, the member states, the politicians have to be bold, as we like to say, brave, and say, okay, we need a strong budget for culture, so a stronger, a higher creative Europe, so that we can help all the different areas of this sector properly, especially with this crisis going on. We will have to manage this issue. That's, that's always the positive and optimistic approach that we like to, to, to promote. But we have to be also pragmatic and, uh, and we are very pragmatic in SEPI. The difficulties with the cultural, uh, so cultural and creative budget are not the news. There's always been uh, a problem with that already before. With this pandemic, clearly, this has been exacerbated. Um, what we, we can see at the moment is there is also a difficulty in communicating at the national level the typology of funding and opportunities that Europe is making available. So the first thing that SEPI is really asking the, the EU institutions, and when I say the EU institutions, I mean all of them across, so commissions and, and the parliament, so it's not just a request towards the commission, is that please tell us better where the opportunities are, because we have a lot of small and medium enterprises that are struggling at the moment. And we can see there are so many different programs available. Sometimes it's difficult even for experts that are working at the European level, like associations like ours, to really identify them and to really make sure that who is at the national level can really apply for them and recognize them in the first place. So I think the EU should do, first of all, a reflection on this, because if you look at that, it's a labyrinth of funding, which is fantastic. 
but we need guidance and we don't need too much. We need perhaps some documentation that could be shared with European associations that we can cascade at the national level so that in our case, small and medium enterprises, production companies could have easy access and understand. That would be the first, the first thing that I would take into consideration. In the parliament, I've heard some members of the parliament flagging developing an SME's strategy, so a small and medium enterprise strategy. We would really welcome that and we hope that the commission can take this idea and bring it into this plan, media plan, that they are working on at the moment. That is crucial because um, the SMEs are vulnerable, but they are also the you know, backbone of Europe at the, at the moment. They are the ones who are bringing all this cultural diversity, wide and diverse content. And they are also the ones that are employing a lot of artists, performers. So again, this is the chain I was telling you about. Apart from that, clearly there are also some areas that specifically for the film and audiovisual sector, it will be important to keep in mind when you are trying to overcome this crisis. Otherwise, it will be difficult to overcome it. One is the setup of European insurances for co-productions. That is something that we as SEPI, but also other associations in Europe have highlighted a lot. Because whilst you are able to sort of going back to normal at the national level, trying again to, to start productions that were stopped or put on hold for the moment um, because of COVID. When you decide to co-produce, it's very difficult because it can happen anytime that you decide to travel to Portugal from Italy because you want to co-produce, somebody in the cast or the crew gets ill you have to stop the production completely. And that is a big problem, a very big problem. So at that point, you know, uh, we had examples at European level in SEPI, brought forward by associations like FAMA in Austria or USPA in France, um, where, you know, you had, you had the chance to develop co-productions insurances. They are not real insurance in the real term, uh, Joao. They are um, really funding allocated to protect, to preserve the businesses if somebody gets ill. So that is the beginning. We know that in Ireland, in Belgium, in Italy, they are discussing this at the moment, but they are at national level. So they are insurances or funding allocated at the national level. In Austria, for instance, if nobody uses that fund, the, the fund will be um, you know, uh, given back to the ministry. So it's, it's interesting. So it's there, but it's not there. <laughs> so so it's, uh, it's an interesting concept, but at least it's there. As I say, at least you are preserved in the way you can go and produce. Um, if you have to co-produce with another European country, you will not be insured. This is the case of France, for instance. That is why it is crucial that at European level, they will allocate some money to allow these productions to happen, uh, co-productions to happen, so that if you decide to go and co-produce with Czech Republic or with Slovakia, you are kind of insured. It would be a great help for a lot of production companies. And uh, this has been a message that SEPI, you know, pushed a lot with the relevant commissioner, with Commissioner Breton as well. And we hope because, you know, which was a very good news, uh, culture has been put amongst the 14th, you know, sectors uh, that have been considered as crucial during this pandemic and in need of support. So it's important that the institutions know very well where we are going to allocate the money. 
and this would be the, the right way to make sure that sector can start again, can produce again, and short content, and move the economy of Europe once again, because we need that uh, right now. I think you, you touched up on a very, very <laughs> difficult issue at the moment, and with a lot of discussions that are taking place in so many different directions. I'll try to sum up as, as much as I can. For CEPI, obviously, we understand very well um, the importance that, uh, that a lot of the products that we produce, either for TV or, or film, the best is that they are viewed by consumers and, uh, and that they are circulating. So that is definitely not a question that is under you know discussion that's that's why we produce so because we want the consumers to watch what we do that's for sure but of course we also have a business model that is very important to be respected in a way because it's a, a business model that has allowed the real circulation of the movies in so many different countries and um, so the fact that there is definitely a kind of digital transformation of what we are witnessing at the moment is something that SEPI has embraced and uh, we have said that many times because we have been part of important um, innovative projects like Media Road that I, I think I had mentioned in the past with the broadcasters, where there is a current discussions uh, going on about the best way also to make sure that the content is out there, viewed by the consumers and so on. Um, what we can say is that, first of all, uh, there is certainly a space for improving uh, the kind of uh, potential uh, that in some countries certain movies can have and that not always have. So in those countries where there is not a regulation going on, um, I don't feel like I would be personally against uh, you know, promoting or watching a, uh, a movie on a platform that perhaps the, it's been created by a small distributor or a small online company and so on, if there is that chance, because that movie doesn't have any other access, especially at the moment with COVID, there have been situations where that has happened in Belgium, for instance. Um, but I also have to say that there are billions of other situations where it is thanks to the real uh, relationship and meetings that producers and distributors have at festivals, at uh, markets, that you can really make sure that the, the best content is out there and you know that consumers can watch it and so on. And that is a crucial part of our business. And and it would be like if I decide to produce a car and it's not the right example here and I forget to put the, the wheels or I don't know. It's the same for us. If we don't have this part of the business, um, it changes completely the picture. And if you and we have to be also realistic sometimes when you go to certain platforms uh, because you want to put some movies, it's true, they might have more access. But if you check how much money, how many clicks you made out of those movies, I'm sorry to say that that uh, is not a real recoup for the producer. And that means the producer will not be able to reinvest them, that money in another movie. And that means that you will not be able to employ an act, two actors, uh, I don't know, the script writers and so on. So it's a chain that goes on and um, and so you have to be realistic in into that i understand your daughter because uh, not because uh, <laughs> i'm young but i used to be <laughs> so <laughs> 
So, of course, and I don't like to, you know, to, to say that, uh, that we are dinosaurs. We are not dinosaurs. Producers are not dinosaurs, as we are always uh, pitched in several <laughs> um, systems of, of, and debates. Um, we are awake. Uh, I have a lot of young producers that produce uh, web series for, you know, mobile use. Um, they are there, they are innovative. When the product is good, it will travel and it will be there. So that is something to, to reflect on, to think about. Um, there are also a lot of opportunities as well via the social media sometimes, especially for young uh, for youngsters, I remember we were in uh, Monaco TV Festival and we had a big uh, sh workshop there discussing exactly this, uh, um, Joao. It, it was about, okay, we have the possibility to engage the consumers now, nowadays. How do we do that? And we had very good discussions with the Spanish broadcasters because you create the content and you manage to engage the consumer also to change the story, to be engaged in the story. And that all happens via the social media. It's a new technique. It's not for all. It's for the youngsters. If I think of my parents in Italy, they will look at me like, what does it mean uh, getting it? Because it's a different typology of audience. So it's important for the producer thinking, okay, for what segments are we going to produce? And sometimes to adapt. But the importance is that they know the market. They know where to invest and where a certain typology of product would work best in a market that in another, best on a type of um, environment that in another. So a Netflix, uh, as you said, a cultural Netflix, I don't know if it uh, would work. Uh, I know that to maintain a platform, let's think hypothetically, like a big Netflix uh, European platform, let's call it uh, the European Netflix, even if I don't like to call it like that, um, it will cost a lot of money to maintain that typology of platform. And this is, a, this is a fact. Where are we going to get this money? Is it Europe that is going to put this money for such a platform? Are we sure that putting all the content there will really help the, the sector? I have doubts. It's, I saw this in the past uh, done in Europe. It had a different name. I'm not going to mention it, okay? Because uh, I don't want. But uh, how this platform has been really used by consumer it's a question mark. So do we want to waste money into something that we are already knowing that is not going to bring us too much? Let's invest instead in different ways, giving more money to the development side of the production, for instance, making sure that even, for instance, because I don't like to say we don't want to talk about digital platforms because this is not uh, our approach. But there is a program called Horizon Europe. Nobody talks about that. They all talk about Creative Europe. But Horizon Europe recently has created a third pillar that might be dedicated to culture and creative industries. And this pillar could be useful funding-wise to address all areas like digital platforms, artificial intelligence that is useful for producers, um, blockchain, I'm, not, I'm only mentioning virtual reality if we think about the animation sector. Why don't we try to reflect on that pillar and use Creative Europe as much as we can to produce high level content because this high level content is the content that in the end finishes in Netflix, Amazon, Apple. And there, you know, it's not always uh, guaranteed that it's the first type of content that you will see. Sometimes you are lost in these platforms and I'm, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything uh, that is a surprise. 
because they have specific algorithms. So, first of all, what's happening with this algorithm? Uh, how can we make more transparent certain type of data regarding how many people watched a program that we have put on these platforms? I mean, we have a, a, a legislation that ask broadcasters to give us a report, I think every two years, if I remember correctly, that tell, you know, tell us how many independent producers program have been watched uh, in these linear broadcasters and now in their platforms. Why shouldn't we get the same from uh, the online VOD platforms? That's important. We want to know. It's an important aspect. So we see how our product is doing in their, uh, in their platform. And the second issue with that is that, and, and I can't generalize because this is changing according to the member states, okay? But in several member states, when platforms make deals with producers, very often these platforms keep all the rights of you know the product that you are giving them it's not a surprise this is happening very often in spain i've heard it many times and in many other countries so i think and we would like to see in the future of this european uh, construction of of legislation and regulations more European debates about the discussion of potential intra-professional agreements between producers, between platforms, and between broadcasters. I think what they, very often, Joao, they are called terms of trade in the UK, they have other names in other countries, there are not so many. But when these terms of trade exist, you have uh, an exponential growth for the audiovisual sector. This is the case of the UK. It's the best terms of trade I've seen in the first place. It's the case for France. It is the case in Germany. The role that these uh, gatekeepers uh, are playing uh, nowadays. And it, it is one of the, I think, of the priorities that uh, a lot of uh, stakeholders and players in the audiovisual sector, but also in other sectors, are focused at the moment in Europe. Um, there is, uh, at the moment, a big uh, consultation that has been launched by the European Commission, and it is on a dossier called Digital Service Package. And, uh, and on this specific consultation, you will find as a stakeholder, so in, in our case as SEPI, but also as a consumer, an opportunity to respond and to say what you think, because a specific part of this consultation is exactly dedicated to the role of, the, of these gatekeepers. And there's no doubt that uh, these, new, these, these gatekeepers are clearly, I won't mention them, but we all know them, are uh, making a fortune out of a sort of deregulation. And this is not the fair level playing field where we like to operate. So they should adapt to the European uh, kind of ecosystem as much as others operators have adapted. And that's something that we strongly believe in. Um, they have a lot of hidden advertising, as you are uh, also mentioning. And uh, this is a clear difficulty for a lot of broadcasters that invest in content that is produced by independent producers. If you have a decrease of advertising revenues in a broadcaster, as a consequence, you will have less money to invest in independent production. But the same doesn't happen in the platforms that are shaped and managed by these uh, players. So it is important that the EU intervene on this very carefully. Uh, because we are talking about the European market, you have to preserve 
the small and medium enterprises and the production companies that are competitive in the market, in the European companies. And to do so, you will have to really take new measures. And if you go through this consultation, it's a very long consultation, 60 pages. <laughs> so SEPI is doing it for the producers in synergy with the producers to understand what could be done. A lot is related to the transparency of data. Once again, it plays a cru crucial role also with these European ga gatekeepers. Sorry, not European gatekeepers, let's specify. And um, a lot is also related uh, to an aspect that is often forgotten, but it's very important, which is the aspect of illegal content that, you know, it's uploaded on these fantastic platforms that uh, it's uh, just a way of a continuation of the promotion of piracy at the European level. This is crazy. This is outrageous for a sector to have to put up with such, uh, such a situation because we know there are a lot of discussions at the European level, even if you think about the Copyright Directive, there are guidelines that are under construction at the moment, also to take care of this aspect. But it is important that whoever decides to respond to this big consultation that I just mentioned on the DSA, so the Digital Service Act, has to really keep in mind what type of data this platform should share in the future to make sure that you can tackle those criminal organizations that are pursuing with their business with piracy. I mean, only because we sell a cultural product, that doesn't mean that it's not a product. It is a product and if somebody else uses it and sell it without our consent, it's fifth. So you are, you know, in a situation where you really have a lot of data that came out just in this uh, period, uh, Joao, during the crisis. More people stayed in front, you know, of TV and of, on platforms. And a lot of data showed that there has been a massive increase of piracy. So this is also an aspect that when we decide to deal with regulation in relation to these gatekeepers, it should be taken into consideration very strongly. So transparency of data for different kind of purposes, fighting piracy, but also making sure that, you know, we are working in a fair European market with all the players, not just with some players. That uh, has to be the message. I agree with you that in many cases, the, the, the digital transformation and digital literacy, as you, as you mentioned, is not very well understood or promoted and cascaded across the different member states and authorities and, uh, and even businesses sometimes. But at the same time, I've seen during these last 10 years a real shift in the way also this topic has been treated at the European level, at the, the level of the European institutions. I'll try to make you some concrete examples. Um, first of all, in relation to how to be sure that uh, in, the, in the way we normally work, for instance, in the audiovisual sector, there is not a digital gap that put away uh, the way in which young people work and adults work. That was a big question that SEPI tried to address in synergy with the trade unions at the national level, um, with the European Broadcasters Union, um, just to un understand where is this digital gap? Where is that we need as businesses, but also as representative of the staff, have to meet and make sure that whatever system uh, 
digitally uh, transformed we decide to create it really works and that was the project that lasted uh, for two years of case study big you know uh, kind of examples uh, coming from you know the national member states uh, from the skills council also that were operating in all the member states and of course the educational institutions like universities or um, educational institutions that provide apprenticeship on digital literacy to understand how uh, young people have to evolve because it's not so immediate. Very often you have a lot of young people that study at university, but they are not ready to work in the, you know, in the business. So with um, filming or uh, uh, even to transform uh, articles that maybe earlier were more paper related. Now you have to be fast, you have to be in a blog, you have to be on a social media and so on. So that was very much discussed and was discussed also how can we create protocols between educational institutions and businesses to make sure that whatever we create makes sense and that young people are ready and uh, to work in the audiovisual and film sector. That was an example. Um, a lot of discussions also took place because also the nature of work uh, is changing so much that is affecting also the more mature generation. So you cannot forget that there are people 50 over 50 that are not necessarily so up to the task with the digital transformation. So I think the European Commission has understood this very well and they are trying to to push this digital transformation but a lot of discussions i think has to continue in parallel with the business and if they lose the the discussion the synergy with the businesses they will create monsters digital monsters that are not going to be fruitful neither for the business nor for the young people that will not be employed by the businesses. So that is something that uh, it's been discussed quite a lot. Um, in the other project that is very also innovation and research orientated that SEPI has been part of called Media Road with the broadcasters, we decided to create with the broadcaster um, sort of uh, sandboxes. So small ecosystem where you can have broadcasters and small and medium enterprises where they meet and they try to develop concepts that you would not do normally if you are one single producer because when you are only one producer sometimes you don't have a big innovation department so this money allocated for this kind of ecosystem was very good because you could experiment you out and you could fail. You know, it's important that you experiment and you also fail to produce and to develop concepts that are better. I think that was very interesting for um, the, the discussion exactly that took place, for instance, on uh, uh, virtual reality. We learned a lot about how virtual reality is not only for consumption, so it's not only for uh, helping the, the consumers to enjoy, to have the best uh, kind of uh, uh, view of, of, of the content. But it's also virtual reality for production. And this is so true in the animation sector. It's unbelievable. The discussions we managed to have in relation to that. Because sometimes you are an animator and you might have to design uh, the same... Uh, kind of layout over and over again and you know sometimes it can be a lot of time consuming that you can avoid if you use the right uh, application via artificial intelligence for instance that saves you a lot of work or puts you in a condition that um, you can use virtual reality because you put yourself as a designer as an animator inside and design what you need to, to do for that specific content. Um, gives you a better perspective 
these things you understand more if you if you are in front of of the video of course but for the animators who are experts on that it's a big support so when digital is a great support we are fun of it we want it we we want to make sure we can make the most out of it and that is why we support it so much this horizon europe program and this new pillar where we hope there will be a lot of money allocated to companies that can uh, also do this digital uh, literacy training that could be of relevance for a lot of small and medium enterprises that could be web webinars that you decide to develop at the national level explaining certain things um, it could be capacity building where you really go member state by member state especially in the ones that are more disadvantaged and you teach where it is needed to be teach, taught. So um, there are opportunities there. I think the commission is on the right track on that. So we hope that it will be cascaded also to the national member states on this. In my view, there are two different ways to, to make sure your content is visible, is viewed, okay? The first one, and I think is the most important, depending on the typology of the content that you are producing, um, is that you continue the good work that you have done via the Portuguese Association, for instance, APIT, uh, that has worked very closely uh, on the AVMS uh, directive. Uh, there have been uh, recently the guidelines of this directive that have been uh, uh, published at European level. And now each member state, including Portugal and APIT in your case, will have to, you know, kind of transpose this directive at the national level with following the guidelines. And, and I think in that there is a lot of good work that can be done at the national level, making sure there are, you know, the right investment obligation uh, not only towards your national fund, but in general, that investment obligations are asked in order to, for you to produce more content that would allow you to be more visible for a certain type of content. That means a lot also of prominence, the promotional tools that have to go uh, in line with the guidelines and then they are discussed at the national level to show that there is Portuguese content, you know, uh, visible out there uh, that people can watch. And that's very important. So APIT, I'm sure, will work a lot to make sure this element and they've already done. And so it would not be a surprise for me. So this would be probably for the typology of content that is a bit more like high-end TV drama or even film side. For the, the other side of the content that might be web series or smallest content that you can put on social media also in those platforms that are not necessarily European or never European, then of course I agree, there is not really a European place where you can see that. Or there was before, but not. it was not... Uh, exactly for this typology of content. It was called Europeana, but uh, it doesn't have space for social media blogs or, you know, the typology of interviews that we are going to do now. So then my suggestion would be try to apply for Horizon Europe uh, and make a very good application where you create uh, there an experiment, a platform where you can upload this typology on content and see how it works because it's experimentation for you somehow. You haven't really seen yet how it works because you try to put it in different uh, YouTube, maybe Spotify, maybe uh, Facebook. You don't really know how much investment and how much money you make out of that as a return. Of, of your work. For me, it's unknown. Maybe for you, it's known. For me, it's not so known at the moment. So try, create it via Horizon Europe because the money will be allocated for this kind of um, 
cultural and creative new projects. So it should be an experimentation and see whether, whether it's, uh, it's important. I believe that there is a lot of diverse and challenging content that uh, small producers can provide in such uh, uh, small platforms that can be very diverse from the standardized typology of stuff you find in, in many platforms. So I would recommend, because you might have the Portuguese touch in, into that, and maybe there will be somebody else who will have the Italian touch. You should try to, of course, Horizon Europe is supposed to put together different also participants from different uh, member states. So it could be also a good opportunity for you to relate with other producers that are so passionate like you in having this segment of the market. That for me is still very important. I, when we were working in the Media Road project with the broadcasters, we also came across to a lot of uh, small companies that uh, explained that they didn't have uh, direct access to Creative Europe. Because for accessing Creative Europe, you have to have a certain maturity as a business. But in Horizon Europe, maybe you have a better chance as a startupper as well. And sometimes we have a lot of startuppers as well in our sector to find your, your area and to develop this specific segment where you might want to be more in touch with the youngest generation that are the ones that are consuming uh, much more this typology of content very often on social media. And I don't even know how what typology because sometimes after six months what i am doing is already considered old for them they tell me but that is old elena it's past so you know the <laughs> you have to be up to the task all the time with the youngsters and so that maybe is something to think involving the young people as well this is something that i found i i am 40 plus um, and when we, when we decide to develop a European project, which, which has a lot of European money involved, which is addressed to young people, I think we should have young people in it. That is an element that often is forgotten. So if you are thinking of creating something like this, don't forget the youngsters, because they can bring the fresh idea that we haven't thought about. And so, you know, 20 years ago, when I was young, <laughs> I'd like to say, uh, I was studying European studies and I, and, I was, and I was working for my dissertation, which was dedicated to a constitution for Europe, okay? At that time, there was this massive debate about creating this constitution that in the end uh, didn't take place because a treaty was done in, instead, because the constitution was too much at that time to, to be discussed. But why that? Because that, that prescribes that you really give Europe that political power that would need to really make the difference also in comparison to these foreign markets that we have to deal with all the time, from the US today, the Chinese in the future, already now, and so on. So for me at that time, understanding that, ca that Europe was uh, an entity that was promoting cultural diversity, creativity, innovation, so the center of, of, of democracy, media freedom, and all of that really inspired me to do the work that I'm doing today. But today, I also see that Europe is a completely different machine, where really it's tough and difficult if everybody thinks to its own little garden, to really develop a powerful entity. And in the moment that everybody realizes that sometimes they are not very effective, have also the very bad habit to go back to Europe and blaming Europe. 
So this is something as a very passionate European that I do not accept. I like when member states and, and their representatives take responsibility for what they are promoting about Europe to their citizens. That doesn't mean that I justify every action that Europe is undertaking. There are areas where the, the EU has to clearly improve in the communication to the citizens, in the way it is presenting itself uh, in so many different facets that they can be related to the economy, to the social life, to culture, um, to the human rights, anything. So, if the member states and Europe understand, though, that their richness is culture, I think they will have a much better chance to achieve what they are planning to achieve. There is not Green Deal, there is not digital transformation. If you are not able to cascade, to, to inspire your citizens. So you will not simply convince them and your citizens are your businesses, are your authorities, local authorities, national authorities, consumers, everybody, civil society. So that is the big kind of uh, challenge that Europe has nowadays. But artists, creative industries, the TV and film side can help projecting, you know, the, what is the society today, the, the European society. The best and the, and the, and the bad part of it uh, are two combinations that are coexisting and we don't have to hide them. We have to educate them. It's different to, to make sure that what is promoted on the online, it's not disinformation, it's not fake news, because that is another big issue that all of us are facing at the moment with a lot of fake news that political leaders are using for their purposes. And this is not something that is going to help Europe at all. So it's very good that, for instance, they, they are taking actions on the specific level at the European level, because it doesn't seem so effective, but I'm sure that you watch a lot of the, or read a lot of the fake news that appear on our social media. It's disgraceful, but there are people that are not so educated into the social media and believe them. So we need to address all these problems in order to build the European society of tomorrow. It's not an easy task. It is not easy at all. And uh, I wish I had the right response for you, but I don't. That's the reality of facts. I, I am still passionate about Europe. I, I get angry about Europe as well when I hear nonsenses, because nonsenses come also from this. It's not always linear, so to say. I think the first point of contact for all the small and medium Portuguese uh, producer would be APIT. On that, I am pretty sure that that would be the way forward because CEPI and APIT, APIT, I mean, uh, is in the vice president of, of CEPI. At the moment, we cooperate very closely, synergetically, so they are aware of all, you know, the, the European legislation, uh, the European projects we are involved in, and they open up a lot to different typologies of areas that you as producer might be interested in, from digital transformation, from uh, EU funded projects that can help you to write uh, applications for Creative Europe, so to say. Um, of course, anything which relates to the visibility of your content as independent producers in the future. So, I mean, up it, uh, has worked very hard in order to help uh, CEPI and also probably at the national level, making sure that uh, your content will be visible in the future. We have uh, with the AVMS 30% of uh, European uh, work that has been dedicated to independent producer, but uh, 
the work is not finished. It's a fantastic text, but uh, we really need to be sure at the national level that uh, your work, uh, Joao, is visible and, uh, and your colleagues' work is, vi is visible. So there will be a lot of work to be done with your regulator at the national level. Uh, that's for sure in order to have transparency data available in order to show better what type of promotional tools for marketing can be used also from small companies to make sure that their content is visible is out there and so on so that is the first thing um sepi's door are always open uh, it's for us at any time we, we love to meet uh, producers at the national level because it's also a way for us to learn more about the business from the ground, really, and, um, and to understand the concerns, the issues you might have. Uh, your national association filters them, but I also like personally to meet when possible because you have this fresh approach very often that make us boring bureaucrats understand much faster <laughs> areas that we might have not thought about. So that's, uh, that's very important as well. So that's for sure. And then we need a lot of your participation at the national level in support, meaning ideas, uh, comments to legislation, what happens at the European level, and this is the beauty of Europe, that sometimes it's not the same that uh, happens at the national level. There are good consultations with stakeholders, so when we gathered strategic information from you at the national level, it, there is a better chance that whatever legislation you will find later on will be better shaped for the needs that you guys have at the national level. So having your inputs, your feedback is crucial all the time, all the way through. So what I would say it will be, especially because of all the discussion we had today in relation to the gatekeepers and so on, you must be involved in this massive consultation. The deadline is in September. I know we will be in touch with the Portuguese uh, segment of the sector, but stay tuned with everything that uh, we are working on. And uh, especially on the research and innovation side, be brave and use Horizon Europe because money will be funded and allocated into that for digital transformation, which relates to our sector. And it is the time to do that right now.